1986, Billy Cotello Jr. is a young soldier in the Colombo crime family, trained to keep quiet. You made two mistakes, I said. You killed my father, but you just didn't kill me. I'm Bill Cotolo Jr. You've been listening and watching the Burn Down Podcast. Tune in. <laughs>
I would say matches uh, because it's a little bit more natural. If you can get cedar strips, I would yeah. say it's more natural. But torches are much quicker. So and and it's easier to light outside, but yeah, I like match. I like like long wooden matches or or cedar strip mat or cedar strip matches. Um, they just look cooler when you're like inside a cigar lounge. But most of the time, I'll be using a torch. Yeah, yeah it's just much quicker with a torch. Yeah, it's what, the easiest thing. I hear you, right? but I do enjoy the matches. You know what? My dad used to like to use matches, um, and since my inception of smoking, I was always using matches until they came out with the beautiful torch lighters and now i like to collect them yeah they, oh, okay know. so how many so how many uh how many different lighters do you have oh shit ballpark you know, know. ballpark you know a cigar Dozen. smoke yeah okay. that sounds about right yeah okay you know a, a cigar yeah, cigar dozens. people tend to be like a little bit of hoarders like we always just start <laughs> racking up like cigar oh, cutters yeah. and lighters yeah. and he's like what do i do with all this you know I went to, um, there's a joint in Beverly Hills. It's a private place. Um, the Grand Havana Room, I think it's called. What a beautiful joint. But the sad fucking part was, is that I had gotten up from the table for about five minutes just to have a little conversation with someone that was passing by uh, um, that happened to recognize me from the yard. And... I think I went back to the table and I don't know if someone just cleaned the table off, or, wow. but my, um, one of my most expensive, uh, lighters that I had is, you know, for expensive for a, a lighter, excuse me, uh, maybe two and change. Wow. But when I got back, it was gone. Was that a, uh, was that a ST DuPont lighter? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Holy shit. Why you got it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why well, you had a guy go you swipe it? <laughs> no, usually like the most so ST Dupont happens to yeah. be like the high end, most expensive. Not I don't know if it is the most expensive, but but it's up there. I mean, yeah, when you're look looking like 150 plus, two plus, it's usually an ST Dupont. I actually had an ST Dupont myself. My buddy actually got it for me for my birthday, and I'm I myself lost it at a wedding and my, and I, my buddy spent like 300 bucks on it i'm like sorry buddy uh you know it's gone yeah you know it makes you feel like shit too because people go out of their way you know when, especially with me when they find out i like something they kind of like it's always like that gift either a box of cigars or a clipper or a lighter and then when you lose it you feel like shit because the next time you're with them, they're like, "Oh, what's the matter? You didn't, you didn't like the light?" Yeah, I'm like, "No, no, no, brother. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I, I misplaced it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's around. I'll find it." Yeah, it's somewhere. It's somewhere. You just go buy. You just go buy the same exact one. Man. Hey, I found it. Or you could, or you could, <laughs> I found it. Or you could just be like, you know what? It's the, you know, I got so many lighters. This one wasn't on my rotation today. You know, <laughs> it's like my Tuesday lighter. It's funny because there's it's so it, many it, lighters, but they all they all light the cigar the same yeah. the same way. It's essentially oh of course but you know me you know i'm kind of a stickler i like to match a lot so you know if a light that matches kind of like what i'm wearing like a, a, this light i use today oh who you see okay yeah oh that's an interesting yeah that's, an, that's a it's like a right? like a what is that like a purple or like it's a, like a pearlescent purple yeah it changes colors yeah, yeah. that's what i was trying. I, I didn't know the word the light Paralescent. That's a good word. All right. So, Bill. So, for the people who don't know who Bill Cotolo is, you know, why don't you kind of go go back, kind of tell us what your upbringing was like? You know, who is Bill Cotolo? Um, my upbringing. My upbringing. I, I grew up uh, in an area of Brooklyn called uh, Flatlands, Flatlands, Flatbush area. Um, it was mixed. Uh, you had a lot of Italian people. You had a lot of Irish people. Um, and then if you went uh, further south in the area, you would come across, um, back in the day, we used to use the term uh, bad neighborhood. But of course, we don't use that today. Um, so we, we had a mixture of black people as well, um, a lot of Jewish people. But on my particular block, we were, I want to say, at least 80% Italian people. Um, so I kind of grew up a normal childhood, if you think about it, when I was younger. I was into sports. Um, I was always like a kind of like a, a puppy dog 
around my dad, you know. Um, I'll give you for an example, like if I knew he was on his way home, um, I'd be sitting on the stoop waiting for him, you know, yeah. just to grab his briefcase, grab his coat, you know, um, washing his car just about every day, making sure there wasn't a speck of fucking dust on it, <laughs> um, sweeping leaves, uh, you name it. I did all the normal things that young kids did uh, back in the day, especially in Brooklyn. Um, I grew up playing a lot of sports, which I really enjoyed. Um, it was kind of like my, uh, my, my escape. You know, I used to get hit a lot as a kid. I used to get beat a lot from my father. Um, I can't say they were mostly warranted, um, but I got them a lot. Uh, I was punished a lot. So get the wooden spoon um, like me. He, I wish it was a wooden spoon, man. <laughs> my dad used to go to work on me like he was hitting people in the street. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I kind of grew up pretty fast. By the time I hit, like, the age of 13, uh, the beatings kind of stopped. Um, we had, like, a kind of like a, a conversation. Um, we explained to me, you know, you're now a teenager. You know, uh, the choices you make, the people you hang out with, you're going to be judged with the company you keep, um, you cannot embarrass me. Um, I kind of, I kind of knew that my dad wasn't the, that regular nine to five type guy. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't until I seen him, he beat the shit out of some guy across the street one day, uh, actually one night, uh, they, long story short, they were making a lot of noise. And it was right underneath my father's bedroom window. And my dad had just yelled out the window, hey, keep it down. And at this point, they were kind of new to the neighborhood. And they didn't, know, they didn't know my dad. So they were out there drinking. And one of them said something smart to my dad. And I remember being up in my room. And I was able to hear my dad come down the hallway, you know. And I heard like a flurry of steps, you know, of him down the hallway. And I'm like, what the fuck? And he made a beeline down the stairs in a row, goes out front, grabs the guy and literally beat the shit. He had him over a car. And I mean, pounding this guy into submission. I'll in, give the guy in a, a row. He took he, in a row. In a row. In a row. <laughs> yep. And I had just gotten to the door the front door and I just happened to open it and look out and see my father bloody this guy and I can't even say it scared me it kind of like it kind of lit a fire under me at that young age and after seeing that it kind of made me want to go out and start fighting Wow, you know and I would fight a lot in school you know get suspended, um, shit like that. But at the age of 13, I want to say 13, 14, it, it seemed like everybody else in the neighborhood knew about my dad. They knew of him. They knew what he was. And for us, me and my two sisters at the time, we didn't know too much, you know, but we did know that everybody was afraid of my dad. And I just thought, you know, he's a tough guy and, you know, people are afraid of him. So it wasn't until one day I was in school and there used to be a, a guy by the name of, you guys probably aren't going to know the name, but the guy's name was Rudy Ferrone. And he was the boss of the Jersey family, the De Cavalcanti family. Uh, the Sopranos were, was based on that family. I read that, actually. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, true. And he, he, he had a son by the name of Mark. And every day we would go into school, and we never got along. He was just one of them fucking little prick kids that just wanted <laughs> to start with people, start with girls, you know, call them, you know what I mean? Call he was a, a problem causer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Instigator. I, instigator, I there it I, is. Yeah, an instigator. 
So, but I did find out later on that the kid had issues, which I didn't know at the time. But, you know, we're talking, I want to say eighth grade. I think it was about the eighth grade. And we used to fight maybe once or twice a week as if like it was planned. Like, you know, you ready? Uh, okay. Today, <laughs> like if you didn't get, if you didn't have your two fights, you're like, well, what did I miss this week? Yeah. What the fuck happened? I missed yeah, something. It was, it was either like, Hey, look, I'm punished. Uh, I ain't got time for this today. Or, you know, we fought. <laughs> so one day he, he just happens to come into school and he looked very docile. Like his face was kind of like off color, but kind of pale. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm like, it's too early for this. It was early in the day. And he says to me, this is verbatim, he says, uh, we can't fight anymore. I'm like, what the? F- what are you talking about? He's like, well, you know, your dad knows my dad. Like, okay. I said, so? What's that got yeah, to do I'm with like, anything? So? <laughs> uh, he said, well, my dad said that, you know, I can't pick my hands up to you anymore. Right then and there, I just socked them in the fucking face, you know? (laughs) You're trying to bring, like, like, come on, come on. (laughs) Yeah, I might as well get one good one in if that's the route we're going. Um, He didn't hit me back, and I went home, and I explained it to my dad. He says, you know, this kid, blah, blah, blah. He said, his father knows you. Hey, what's Willie? My my dad used to call me Willie. Willie, you know, what's his name? I said, uh, the last name's Farone. And my dad used to, like, you know, do this thing with his... My, my dad was a, a huge prodigy, prodigy guy. Um, the prodigy's 150s were his favorite. He used to smoke them all fucking day long. Wow. You know? And he would just... He looked at his cigar and he's just like... Did you say Farone? I said, yeah. He says, yeah, I am very... I'm very, you know, dear friends with his father. He's like, what are you fighting about? I'm like nothing it's like we just fight and he says Willie no he goes you guys can't fight no more Rudy's right and I went back to school the following day and I said st- my dad had told me to tell the kid you know to let his father know that he was aware of the situation um and that he sends his love and so we hit it off from there we became asshole buddies you know, the two of us, two kids that could never get two words in kindly, kindly to each other. We became fast friends. Uh, so you guys went you guys went from like sparring buddies to best buddies overnight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but here's the key. The next words out of his mouth were, you know, you realize we don't have to work. And I'm like, We ain't got to work. I'm like, what do you mean we ain't got to work? Well, you know, without dads and their positions, you know, we're set for life. And I'm like, what the fuck is this kid talking about? Was he a bed bug? So, so like, at, at the time, at the time, you didn't know, like officially know what your dad no, did. You kind of no. had an inkling, but you didn't really know for sure. Exactly. The, the only inkling that I had was that my dad had like uh he had like back in the day it was a man cave you know he redid the whole basement it was rug on the walls at the time uh he put like one of the big screens when they were fucking huge um down there he had a full bar um and uh the next thing i know is that he's telling me willie you see the poster over there? And it was a poster of Al Pacino from The Godfather. I says, yeah. And he says, do you see the pictures on the wall? And I'm like, it was pictures of James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart. Mm, um, yeah. Uh, a few other people who played gangsters back in the day. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, what do you think of that? I'm like, I don't know. I love the Godfather movie. I thought it was great. Uh, I says, as far as White Heat and, you know, uh, at the part where he turns around and said, James Cat, look, mom on top, you know, mom on top. 
He's like, what did, what did you know, what's your spin? I'm paraphrased, but you know, what's your take? And I'm like, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know where you're going with this. And that's when all of a sudden it was as if like a switch went off from my head. And I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> Light bulb. <laughs> Bing. <laughs> yep. And then I'm looking at the cigars, you know, and, uh, he was a union guy. Um, guys were always coming by the house to see him. Had to talk to him. My dad would go outside and talk for a while. Always bringing him gifts. But as soon as I seen another man kiss my dad on the cheek, it knocked me for a loop. That was it. Yep. And I was like, Wow, we got guys kissing guys right out in the open. Like, <laughs> so my dad used to bring me around to his social club when I was younger. Um, probably at the age of 10, 11, 12. But it was not like the social clubs as if like, like we know them today. It was a, a bodybuilding gym. It was kind of like a front. Uh, it had a couple of video games in there, the table and shit. And he would take me down on a Saturday every now and again. And that's when I started to notice how all these guys would roll up, jump out of a beautiful car, you know, kiss him on the cheek. They would go in the back. They would talk for a while. Um, and then it was just like one guy after another guy after another guy. And then you're like, ah, shit. Now I got it, you know. And I started to become arrogant you know i started to think that i need to mimic him i need to act like he acts i need to talk like he talks now again you're, you're still young you can't get away with that stuff but as i got older um 17 i think was the first time i literally stepped foot in in our social club on 11th avenue and he introduced me to a lot of guys. And a lot of the guys were older guys. You know, they weren't young guys. You know, I'm talking about guys in their 60s, 70s at the time, even guys in their 80s. And he would tell me, you know, listen to Joe Smash. You know, listen to uh, Joe Colombo. You know, listen to these guys. They've been around the block. You wow. know, they could share things with you. And he wanted them to share things with me that I guess he couldn't say to me at the, at the time, especially if eventually going to be straightened out. There are certain things that, you know, your dad, your dad uh, can't speak to you at that point. You know, your skipper can, but your dad can't. Yeah. So my dad used to have a phrase when I wanted to talk to him, um, Hey, Pop, listen, I need to talk to you. All right, which hat am I wearing? Am I wearing the Pop hat or am <laughs> mm. I wearing the Skipper hat? Mm. You know, so... There's one that's like family be... or business. Like, what... what exactly. the, how do you want How do you yeah. want me to go about this conversation, right? Because it's two completely different exactly. ways. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Because there's two different angles that you have to go about. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so growing up in, in, in that area and learning, at, I would say it's a fairly young age, you know? Um, I mean, considering what you that. considering what seventeen and eight year old kids are doing now. <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh man. Yeah. yeah exactly. You know, please, I don't even want to get started. Oh gosh, man, we, that could be a whole. We can save that for a part two. Yeah, it could be part two. Of the episode. <laughs> okay. Because you know, you know, it's so funny you say that because every time I I, I do something with someone, um, the next thing they'll always say to me, I, I just did um, a show with, I don't know if you guys know who Larry Mazza is, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, Larry and I, the Colombo family went through a civil war from 91 to 93. And Larry was on the opposite side. Greg Scarpa, so right? You were out there trying. Yeah. 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 So, and Greg Scarpa was a maniac. And him and my dad, um, my dad had liked Greg to a point, but my dad always had his reservations about Greg. He, for some strange reason, he felt that Greg was a rat before it 
even went public. I mean, and I'm talking about years, years, years prior. Um, but the the main thing he had said to me about Greg was, he's like, Willie, the part I don't get is that he takes every contract. He doesn't turn down any contract. Yeah. And he would fill them, you know? So that kind of perplexed everybody. They're like, hey, if he's out to commit murders, can't be bad, you know? Can't be. And lo and behold, as we found out, he was. But so Larry and I were on, on opposite sides and we reconnected um, about two years ago. And they just started this new thing on something called Plex TV, P-L-E-X. You could get it on your app store. And they, we started, well, they started a channel and I'm on the ground floor with them, knock on wood. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Mob TV and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all mob stuff. Really? So, yeah, you'll, you'll see mob docs on there. You'll see old gangster flicks. Um, so, and it just started. So it's slowly starting to pick up steam. People are just starting to learn about it. And I think it's addicting. So he just started a show. Uh, it's called Larry Mazza. I believe Larry Mazza, you know, The Life. And I was the first uh, interview. Yeah, that he did. I, I think I saw and, a picture um, with with you and him on your Instagram. Mm-hmm. You and you and another yeah. gentleman. I forgot. Mm-hmm. I didn't know who the other yeah, guy was. Yeah. That's Frankie Steele, oh. uh, a heavy set bold guy. Yeah, Larry Mazza yeah. was in the in the middle. You were on, I guess, your right or the picture left, and there was someone else on the other side. Right, right. You had a cigar in your so, hand, of course, always. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was smoking a. Uh, Connecticut Cohiba that night. Oh, nice. Uh, oh, he actually just got a pack of those. I mean, you smoked one the other day on, yeah. the, on the show. I, just, I have a pack sitting in there waiting to uh, waiting for the new humidor to season up. I, I enjoy them. I, I really do enjoy them. You know, they're not Cubans, but, you know, it's still a nice smoke as far as I'm concerned. I would say um, that for, for the non-Cuban Cohibas, I think that that might be my favorite, uh, my favorite one. Out of their whole non-Cuban brand. Which one do you like better? Do you like, I know there's a blue dot, there's a red dot. I would say I the, believe the, I believe it's white. I would say the, yeah, the white one, the Connecticut white one. Gold, yeah. yeah. I think the that might be my, one? yeah, my favorite. Out of their non-Cubans. I do love their, their Cuban line, um, but that's a completely separate line. Have you tried the red dot one? I have. I I've tried the. Uh, they have a couple of other. The, yeah, uh, blue dot, a, a black, a black. No, there's the. Uh, um, I think it's two. Is yes, it the Royale or no, or the the Spectre? There's another yeah, one that the came Sp- out with. Yeah, there's a Spectre and the Royale. The red dot is the Royale, mm-hmm. and I think they charge like twenty five to thirty for them. Yeah, they're not they're not cheap. The Spectres over no. here a hundred plus in New York. Yeah, they're crazy. Serious. Yeah, Spectres I mean, over Spectres over here wow. like a hundred. I mean, we have a seventy five percent cigar tax. So that hikes up the price a lot. Yeah. But um, yeah, the scepters. 75%. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Man. We actually just did an episode a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago, all different cigar taxes, and New York is like top five. Oh, yeah. And Arizona, we're like down at the bottom. Yeah, you guys are nice. We're down at the bottom, you know? That, but that... so, yeah, so I did Larry's first show. Um, I was kind of nervous going in. Uh, we did it in Vegas. Um, but the... The interview for Larry and I, it's so personal because of the things that we saw and things that we went through. So it gets heavy at times, especially if you're removed from that life, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're talking, you know, all these images and everything that we went through at the time are all going through your head. And at one point, if you watch it, you can see, you could actually feel the heaviness right through the television because Larry had a love for my dad. Even though he was on the other side, he really did not not have much of a choice. Greg did not give him a choice. But if you watch it, you can tell that Larry's eyes get heavy. And at the same time, Larry's eyes were getting heavy 
mine were as well, you know, and it took a lot for me to hold back tears, you know. Um, Larry is someone that is so remorseful um, of the things that they've done in that life, and so am I. And I think that's one of the, the beautiful human aspects of my life today, um, is that I am very proud at the fact that I was able to walk away We'll get into it, but maybe not necessarily as much on my terms, but I was still able to walk away. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, here I am sitting across from you guys and still able to have this this conversation. Um, That's why social media for me, I really don't like it. I'll be flat out honest with you. I never did. Um, I have three children. Um, we'll also talk about the show if you guys want to. Um, but it wasn't until we embarked on doing Families of the Mafia that they kind of requested, uh, that we have a platform. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started on Instagram. And in the beginning, I felt like it was going very far left where I was getting attention, like negative attention that I really didn't want. Like, mm-hmm. hey, what are you up to? How have you been? Um, I even had one one person turn around and told me, tell me that, Bill, if you were to come back to New York today, you'd probably be boss of that family. And I'm like, that was like a... Hit you the wrong way. A riveting comment. Yeah, it was Yeah, so you're, like, you're like, out of everything that you could say, like, that's what you choose? That, right? Exactly. And, that, you know, it kind of hit me. And, you know, after talking with my children and explaining to them that that's not where I want my platform to go. I really don't know where I want it to go, but I do know that I don't want it focused solely or mainly about that life. Mm-hmm. You know, every chance I get, I want to speak ill of the life, not about the people but the lifestyle itself. Mm, mm. That's a key point. Behind it. That's a key point to you say know? that it's not about, you're not speaking ill about the people. You're speaking ill about mm. just the life and what what it brings to others. And I notice on your platform too, on, on what you've done, and it's kind of hard to miss your comments because you throw all the emojis in there too. And it's good because like as you're scrolling through, I'm like, oh, that's Bill's right there. And everything that you say on the platform, <laughs> it's always positive. Yeah. It's always uplifting. And I think it's just beautiful because it's a representation of how, you know, yes, you had that one life, but like you said, you got out of it, not necessarily on your terms, but the bottom line was that you got out. And now going forward is you're all about this life of inspiring others and bringing positivity to others, which we can resonate with because that's what we're all about too. So it's a, it's that's actually what you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we try. And, and it's funny um, how I, I actually came across, you know, your profile because you would originally, like like Justin said, you would put all these emojis on, the, on our comments and the videos and stuff. I'm like, who is this guy? So like the very first time I just clicked on you and I, it, w- it must have been like less than 10 seconds. I was like, oh, it's just an, you know, an Italian guy down in Florida who likes cigars. All right. Ne- <laughs> next. But then over the time, you kept would comment and I'm like, who is this guy, Bill? I'm like, you know, what's he all about? And then I, and then I actually looked at your profile. I saw the different hashtags like the happy gangster, uh, families of the mafia on MTV. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And then obviously, you know, I did my Google searches and stuff. And then, um, right. you know, then it just progressed from there. But then I was like, you know, you're a very positive and encouraging person. Like you always have nice things to say and mm-hmm. like always good like words of affirmation. That's very positive. Yeah. You know, you, that's thank you. Thank you so much for that because that means a lot to me um, from the bottom of my heart, honestly. Um, listen. I, I feel like I've lived three lifetimes already. Um, I've seen such horrific things in, in, in I'm only 52, I'll be 52. Um, the things that I've, I've seen and gone through, I, I honestly wouldn't wish it on someone that I have a distaste for because I don't hate anybody. I really don't. Um, but even if it's someone that I have a distaste for, um, 
I wouldn't wish the things that um, I've gone through, my family's gone through, and and most importantly, the things that we put other families through, mm-hmm. living that life, you know, people that you've hurt physically, mentally, um, trying to wield power all the time. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it was a complete 180. And as I told my children and my wife that, you know, with this platform, I don't know where it's going. I said, I do know I enjoy smoking cigars. I do love to box um, until my back. Um, So I just wanted it to be always positive. Um, With my family, with the emojis, quickly. My dad had a cold when he would beat me. Uh, It was 08. And for some strange reason, I have, like, if I pour my coffee in the morning, I have to start at 8 time. It's kind of strange. Uh, (laughs) It's nothing with doorknobs and closing and opening a door or anything like that. But when it comes to the emojis, um, I try to include eight if I can. Uh, Most people don't know this, what I just said to you guys. Um, They will now. Um, But so that was the reason behind the emojis. And I always wanted the the emojis to be heartfelt, you know. And I really didn't give a shit if some guy in Brooklyn is like, what what the fuck's this guy doing putting up all hearts and stuff? You know, I, like, look, I'm secure in who I am. So if you don't like the hearts, then just tell me I, I won't put them up, you know, when I'm speaking with you. Yeah, or keep scrolling. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that's that's the reason behind the emojis. Um, but I always want people to feel the love. I don't want anybody to ever look at me and be like, <clears throat> I, I, because this does happen a lot. Um I can't believe I'm talking to you. And that's the strangest thing to me. Like, it, it still is, especially after the show. Like, I could be out, <laughs> I could be at my at my local boss head guy and standing there online waiting for cold cuts. And this just happened, like, last week, I think it was. And I'm standing there, and I'm waiting for the cold cuts. I'm looking at my phone or whatever. I'm always, like, looking around me. Uh I'll never be asleep at the wheel, so to speak. So I just happened to notice this woman, you know, looking over. And my wife was with me. And I I thought it was kind of strange. So I kind of like looked up at her and then I looked back down at my phone. And a couple of seconds later, I looked up and she was still looking. So finally, she comes over. And there's, granted, there's a lot of people around too. And she says to my wife, kind of whispers it. She's like, you guys are famous. And, you know, right away, I know she's talking about the show. So me, I, I'll, I'll talk to everyone. If I could make anybody smile once a day for me, um, it just makes me feel good. Hopefully it makes them feel good. Um, you know, sometimes a simple smile, um, you know, can turn someone's day around Mm -hmm. it could be it could turn their week around it it might might even turn around their month so when she said it to me uh, my first response was um did you like the show and she had said she's like you know out of all the families that were on the show she's like your family came across the realist um and i said thank you and then she was uh, gushing over my children. Um, she had said something beautiful about how we listen to our kids, you know, let them speak and, and we weigh their words and their feelings. Um, and I take a huge, um, uh, I take a huge step back when my children want to talk, you know, um, there's that old saying, um, I'm sure you guys heard of it. 
there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that. So we can listen twice as hard as we speak. So I will always take that step back and listen to my children, give them the floor, you know, and always be honest with them. Yeah. I don't lie to them about nothing. Um, so when she had stopped us, you know, in the place, it, you know, it makes you feel good in a way, you know, because I do know that when we did the show, uh, um, I was very cognizant of making sure that I didn't let any of the younger kids that are going to watch that show and think that that life is okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you're not out there killing people, I don't care. I'm just talking slowly. Yeah. Um, I don't care if you have a Shylock book. I don't care if you're taking action from people or numbers, um, anything about that life. Once you get the taste of the money, it's very, very hard to, you know, walk away from it. You want more. Mm -hmm. It's like anything else in life. That's, it's just, I guess it's our, our, our culture, if you will. You know, we always want more. It's like a drug. It's like yeah. a drug and you're addicted to it. And yeah, what was it? Like, what was it about? I mean, I think it was a large part due to your father, but what was like a large part of that mafia life that intrigued you to, because I know you went to college, your father wanted you to go to college and then you kind of like, well, I kind of work with you now. It's like, so what was it yeah. that kind of intrigued you to not get a really a, a, a nine to five college educated, educated job and kind of work with your father? That's a, it's a great question. Um, it's a very simple answer too. Um, it wasn't the appeal of that life. It was the appeal of knowing that I can be with my dad every day. Mm. You know, if my dad, and I say this to a lot of people, if my dad would have been a plumber, I would have wanted to fix pipes. If he would have been a butcher, I would have wanted to cut meat up. Um, my dad just happened to be a gangster. And I knew how treacherous the life was. And I knew that you couldn't trust everybody. So my frame of thinking was, is that if I follow you into this life, which is not what he wanted, um, I could be with you every day. And not only that, but I could be your guy. I could be your eyes and your ears when you're not around. I can hear what's going on. You know, my ear will always be to the ground. Um, so that was probably the most intriguing part for me. Um, yes, I did think that um, doing other things in life, making money, I always thought that it would be easier for me, obviously, if I had gotten involved in that life um, without thinking of, the people that I'm hurting in the process, you know? So yeah, you do see the nice cars. You do see the big houses. Um, you do see the respect. You do, do see being able to walk into a restaurant and it be packed, but hey, well, your table's over here, Junior. You know, it's those things. Yeah, they're appealing. They, they really are. Um, the women, um, when I was younger, women would just, gravitate to you because they knew you were involved in that life and, and that they wanted to be a part of it. It's, it's strange to me now mm. when I think about it, you know, mm. because I, I, I think to myself, like what woman would want to be in a life where you see all these movies where, you know, one night they're with their wife, the next night they're with their girlfriend. Like it, it, confuse me like why would you want to be in that life even with my wife um my wife and i we're together uh 32 years we just celebrated our 27th anniversary on, on march 18th congratulations congratulations, congratulations. Cheers congratulations thank you, to you guys thank you thank you thank you i don't i don't have a drink with me um We'll drink. We'll drink that. another one Sal for you. Salute, salute to that. Go ahead. You do your thing. It's a little later by you guys, so enjoy. <laughs> um, but with my wife, when I first met her, it was very fluke how I met her. Um, 
but her lot a lot of her girlfriends knew me but she did not and a lot of her girlfriends told her, her like no you don't want to date him and then her friend's mothers or you know and mother and fathers i guess would be like uh, do you know what he does for a living um do you know who his dad is and when she found out she not that she didn't believe it believe it it was just that she didn't see a side of me that would make her think oh i better stay away from this guy or run in the opposite direction um she was almost engaged at the time she was in love with this guy um they might they were having somewhat of problems um and i just said to her in all due respect i would love to take you maybe for lunch or coffee one day if if you'd like um and uh yeah the rest was history we went out once or twice and um yeah like she was the woman for me wow and hopefully it's vice versa uh today today it might be a little different today she probably wants to kill me uh, <laughs> you know five out of ten times but, <laughs> but other than that you know um yeah I, I i i still guys i i don't get the allure especially like with everything that we know today you know especially even with cooperators you know um I know that I would be a little leery about getting into that life now, you know, with technology and mm-hmm. um, the generation today, everything is texting and, you know, talking on the yeah. phone. And everything which, is, everything is saved. Everything's backed up. Everything is, yeah. it's, I, I, I think about it all the time. I'm like, man, you know, being a criminal 30, 20, 30 years ago, like the stories my dad used to tell me, just like basic stuff that he would do. I'm like, you guys used to be able to do that and like have no problems. And he's like, yeah, everything was, it had no cameras. He had none of this. There was nothing. I'm like, I'm like, it's no, so different. No, it was very different. And if you ask me, I don't see, you know, people will say, listen, the marble never die. Yeah, I get it. it it's not, but it is going to dwindle, you know, and the older guys that are still out there today, they're kind of stuck, you know, because you you have to start bringing in new blood and you have to trust somewhere along the line. You've got to trust. And to this very fucking day, I still hate the phone. Like, I don't do a fucking thing wrong and I, I never would. Yeah. But I still don't talk on the phone. Like, people are still like, Go, you, can, you know, give me a holler back. I'm like, God, don't get upset. I, I'm just not a phone person, you know? Like, you want to hang out anytime, you're more than welcome. We'll go do something. But chit chatting on the phone, it's just, it's just not my thing. That was like yeah. when, when, when we had that phone call prior. You know, you, that was like one of the first things you're saying. Like, man, is, you know, not nothing against you, but he's like, you're like, I'm, I'm just not used to being on the phone. I don't really like talking on the phone too much. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, listen, it's all right. And we ended up talking for like 45 minutes anyway. But uh-huh. I, I get it. I get it. And that's like the that's like the like the the funny thing about like the media and like Hollywood. Like they beef up like this whole mafia life. At is it being like glamorous? Yeah, obviously you have your glamorous states being in that life, but. Like, you know, you watch yeah. Goodfellas, you watch The Godfather, you know, they beef up like how it was so amazing. But in really in reality, and you know, looking back at it, you know, it's not a, it's not what it was and it's not really what it's portrayed to be. You know, someone that exactly. follows it, like I follow a lot of that stuff. Like I, I know a lot of the history and the stories. And I was always enamored in the beginning when I was younger of like, like you said, like the lifestyle. And, you know, you watch Goodfellas and you see all the pretty women and the cars and this and that. But then as I hear more and more stories of these guys that used to be in the life, and I'm like, you know, they all say like, you know, uh, it's not what it is. You know, I would change my, I would change my life if, you know, if I knew what it was going to end up being. You know, th- you know, think of it this way. You know, let's say you go out and, I don't know, you rob a bank. And all of a sudden, let's say you got a crew of four and you all get pinched. Now, the government has their way of separating people, you know, ask me a question, ask you a question, ask you a question. And they'll try to ask the same questions in different ways, but the same question nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And they'll go to you and say, well, Billy told us this. 
And, and you didn't. You actually didn't say that, but they're gonna say that you <laughs> and said you never that. Said it. Yeah. But now the seat's created. The seat's created. So now you have three other guys that are on your case, and you're saying to yourself, "You're cooperating." Bill, I swear I'm not. Oh no, no, no! I know you are. You know. So if you know that you're look, staring down the barrel of fifty years, you know, because of Rico, or a hundred years. Who the fuck wants to do a hundred years? <laughs> exactly. It's you know, you know, like the- a, for me, I I don't know, but I would have to pull down at least a half a billion dollars for me to even consider. I don't know, taking sixty years on the chin, especially for somebody that I, I know probably is cooperating or they're gonna cooperate against me anyway. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it turns that it's whoever fuck can take the bone first, mm-hmm. you know, and it sets the tone for everybody else. What, what was like and, the, what was like the, t- like being in that life, being in the mafia life, what was like the toughest part about being in it, like being in it? Like, did you always like have to watch your back or like not trust like the people around you? Like, what was the toughest part of being in it? No, that? you know, for me, the hardest part was just always having to be on 24-7. Um, and that's just because it was my dad. So I really did not have much of a choice. I couldn't say no to things, like if there were certain weddings and, I don't know, you're not in the mood to go. Yeah, It's a weekend. You want to spend it with your wife and, and your kid, but you can't say that, you know? There's, there's a saying that If, God forbid, your wife is sick in the hospital or your kid is sick in the hospital and we call you, you have to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to my dad after my kid was first born, my first born, uh, this was in 97. And I remember going to see him on a Sunday and again, ask the question. Uh, I need to talk to you. Which hat am I wearing? And I said verbatim, uh, both this conversation. And he's like, oh, this is going to be a doozy, I guess. He's like, all right. He says, come on, we'll go downstairs. We'll grab a couple of cigars out of my humidor. And uh, he used to have a beautiful walking humidor. Um, And I'll kick your ass in a game of pool. And he's like, so shoot, what's up? I says, look. I said, there's something that's been weighing on me. Um, It's kind of like what you told me in the beginning when I first started hanging my hat up at the club. He said, what? What is it? I said, you know, it's that whole comment about, God forbid, you know, my wife and my child is sick. And I'm like, if it's not you, meaning my dad, if it's not you calling me, I ain't running for nobody. I don't give a fuck what family it is. If it ain't my family, I ain't going. And he did like one of those looking at his cigars. And he's like, heard. I heard you. Um, I said, so that's it? He's like, no, it's just noted, you know, that if anything is going on with you, I'll say call, I'll say call John or call Mike or Joey Bowles or Mikey Bowles. <laughs> um, and my dad respected that. Um, so like you said, there are those certain things in, about that life that after you start embarking on it, and I started at a young age, um, you start growing tired of it, you know, being told that you have to be at this weight, you know, so-and-so is picking you up. You have to go here and get this done or whatever the case may be, this wedding. Um, It gets, sometimes it's, it's a lot. And you don't want to adhere to the rules all the time. Mm -hmm. And the rules for the most part, are very stringent and they're very clear 
you know. So, you know, that was one of the things that um, kind of sat with me for a while. Um, but it was it wasn't until, like I said, after I had my first born, um, where it really started to tug at my heart, you know. Um, thinking of hurting someone knowing that they have a family at home or loaning a guy money knowing that he needs it let's say to put food on the table but if he can't pay me at the end of the week I gotta hurt him and those things start to weigh on you if you're human anyway mm -hmm. you know um, and they started to weigh on me so the number one thing that I probably despise about that life is probably that, you know, always having to be on, you know, and I don't miss it. Not for one second. So would you say, cause yeah. like you said, you had, you know, there was that life and then now it's, you know, you said you, you've lived almost three lifetimes and you left that life behind. Now it's all about moving forward was promoting, you know, positivity and uplifting people, trying to put a smile on somebody's face every single day. Yes. Would you say it was at that moment when you had um, your firstborn, when it kind of switched over to that new life and you were like, listen, I'm, I don't like this anymore. I think I'm going to make a change. You know, I cried when, when I first put my eyes on my wife and son in the hospital, and, you know, when they first handed my son, well, my son at the time, uh, to my wife. And I remember, like, I just started crying, you know? I wasn't bawling, but I was crying. And my wife thought that they were just happy tears. And they were. Of course they were. But the other part that was going through my mind is like, you got decisions to make, man, you know? And not too long after we christened my firstborn and my dad had thrown a huge party uh, for the christening. And at the end of the party, um, back in the day, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, when you had the camera guy that would go around film the tables and you know sure. stuff like that, they would hand hand the a microphone to someone and say say a few words and so on and so forth. And I remember it was the end of the night, and I was exhausted. Uh, there was a lot of uh, business talk that went on at my son's christening, which bothered me a lot, you know. Um, and the mic had come to me and my wife. Uh, we were sitting alone in a little vestibule in the catering hall. And I remember thinking to myself, how can you keep doing this? Your heart is not in it. And once your heart's not in that life anymore, it's definitely time to make a change. And I remember seeing my dad say a few words. Um, they were beautiful words at that. And they still bring tears to my eyes when I see the clip. And I remember having pause in my mind at the time before I spoke, saying, thank you so much, Pop. I'm so happy to have you back from jail. He had just come home after beating his case um, where he was facing life uh, and he beat it. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't do this to my kid. You know, um, at the time I referred to my firstborn as my son. So I remember thinking I cannot put my son through this you know I can't bring my son into this life I can't have my son thinking the same things I was thinking you know in regards to my dad and wanting to be with him so 
it was around 1997 that I felt a struggle in my heart that I had to make a choice between not the Colombo family, but I had to make a choice, be there for your skipper, your dad, or be there for your son, because you can't have both. Mm. And, you know, I'm someone that has had came to the realization while I was still on the street that in that life, you really shouldn't have a wife. You really shouldn't have children because, you know, you can go to jail the following day for 30 years and you're taking them down with you. And not only that, but they kind of, for all intent and purposes, become like hostages in that life mm -hmm. because you chose that way to live. So... Yeah, around 1997 is when I, I started having those, you know, affirmations that I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. Mm -hmm. you do, know? You, do you think Even that, do you think that your, uh, cause I remember, you, you know, I was watching the documentary and you were saying that your dad didn't want you um, to come into that life. He wanted you to go to school and, and go down that route. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that your dad, there was a point in your dad's life when he had you that he was thinking those same things like, I can't let this kid get into this type of life because he was having those same thoughts that you were having when you had your first son? For sure. Hmm. For sure. My dad, um, he was who he was, and I, and I can't change that. But one thing I can tell you about my, my dad was he really was a good father. He was there. You know, he was present, even though his tactics at times were very different than, obviously, my, my normal friends is what I call them. Um, but he had a great heart, you know, um, loved doing stuff for charity, um, never missed mass on Sunday. And then later in life, he would even go to church on Saturdays, you know. Um, I think, you know, towards the end of my dad's life, he, he wanted to atone for a lot of the, the things that he did in that life and little by little he did, but you can't bring people back that you hurt, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think that that was definitely something uh, for sure, that was in my dad's mind, um, because even my grandfather, who I did not get to know, he died uh, in 1970, uh, right after I was born. And my dad had told me that he hated that life, his grand uh, my grandfather. And these guys, my dad used to, my, my dad's father used to earn uh, own, own a, a burger joint. Uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and my dad used to work there and all the wise guys used to go there and hang out. And my grandfather, I guess, noticed at one point that my dad was commiserating with some of these fellas and he wasn't happy about it. Um, that he literally turned around and told my dad that, hey, if that's the life you're going to live, then you know you can't be a part of this business anymore and um, their relationship was uh, strained, you know? Um, so the answer to your question is, yeah, I truly feel that it definitely crossed my dad's mind um, on, on more than one occasion. Um, I guess I wish in a way now, looking back, I wish he would have said no yeah i don't want you in that life i could set you up and you know to do anything you want but to be in that life nah. yeah because i and, i remember you yeah. you making the statement breaking the chain um i, I watched mm -hmm. something on you and you said or break the breaking the cycle i believe you said mm -hmm. 
breaking, breaking the cycle. cycle. So, the cycle of violence. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, when your pa- when your father did pass away, you kind of felt that that rage of you know this is what I need. This is what I should be doing because this is what happened to my father. You know, they, they unfortunately they killed my father, and I feel you're you're going you want to you're feeling like you should go the route that you were taught. And then, like you said, I think you said something about you seeing your family, you seeing your son and your and your wife. Yeah, in the rearview mirror. Yeah, the picture, the picture, and you yeah. and you kind of said like, yeah. listen, you know, if I do this, I get what's coming to me, and uh, you know, I'm never probably going to see my family ever again. And I think that's when, knowing what you said earlier about kind of feeling that 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 thought of saying, hey, this isn't really the life for me anymore. You know, I think that's it sounds like the breaking point where you kind of just made the decision like, listen, I'm not going down this route. I'm going to break the cycle of what's typically done, I know, for a person in my position. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's it's very interesting. and It's very admirable because you don't really hear, you know, stuff like that from guys like yourself in that in that situation. You you hear that, and, you know, they went off and killed somebody. But like you said, yeah. you, you wanted to break the cycle. Um, and I you know, obviously meet you say your case. Why? You know, that was that was a very heavy evening because the day that my dad was killed, I knew that the window for revenge, you know, there's a huge difference between revenge and revenge. And I had went out one night I knew where to catch up with certain guys. And my dad did tell me growing up as I became more entrenched that if you cannot look at at a picture of your wife and kid, knowing that you might not return or you might go to jail or whatever the case may be, don't do what you're about to do. And the window was very small. There were guys that were deathly afraid of, because obviously my dad was just erased. And the guys that I thought were my brothers acted as if like he didn't even exist that very night. So... I did not know who I was able to trust. So I had literally went out on my own and I was just trying to gauge. And this one particular night I was ready to get out of the car and, and to do something that I knew I most definitely would have regretted. Um, So I remember crying in the car by myself um feeling torn saying one side is saying you have to do this this is what you know especially in that life this is what you know you need to show other people other guys that you are someone that they can get behind you know um and may I just say this, thank God I did not do it. Not, not, not just for the sake in the eyes of God that I always want to be forgiven for my mistakes and my errors of my ways. But if I would have done what I set out to do that this one particular night in which we were speaking, I would have gotten it somewhat wrong because the blood that I tasted in my mouth was reserved for the guy who pulled the trigger, the guy who probably either dismembered or buried my father, because at that point I did not know. Um, And I was not clear at that moment in time of who exactly was responsible. So knowing the things that I know today, I am happy that I did not take the route that I was going to take that night. Um, But this one person that I'm speaking of is doing life in jail right now. 
for the murder of my father. And I don't know how a lot of people look at it. A lot of people might look at it as, Bill, you're playing with semantics or you're trying to split hairs here. But the way I looked at it was this particular guy didn't pull the trigger. This particular guy didn't bury my father, you know? So here you have someone sitting in jail for the rest of their fucking life, you know? Where's the reform? There's no reform. Why? Mm. It's for gangsters. This reform for others, why not for us? Mm. You know, Giuliani imposed the RICO Act. Figure the dopey fuck to figure out how to use it. And to put someone away for 100 years without the possibility of parole and then tack on another three life sentences on top, like, where the fuck is anybody going after that? Yeah, yeah, 100, yeah, one so, lifetime is, is enough for enough for anybody so you tack on three more it's exactly. what difference is it going to make at that point exactly so that's why again we'll revert back to my platform today is i have to call it a platform even though i i don't view it as a platform <laughs> um but that's why i will always try to at least give it my best shot to go out of my way to try to help someone that might be doing life, you know, um, if it was in regards to me or my fault, if you want to look at it that way, um, I've had many sleepless nights because of that. You know, I get to put my head on the pillow at night. Yes, I sleep well because I know I was honest. I know that I did the somewhat right thing, if you will. Um, but I don't feel good about the fact that some people are sitting in jail doing life if they were not there, quote unquote, mm -hmm. for the killing of my dad. So. Well, I, I, I want to, um, I definitely want to, you know, applaud you in, in the fact that Thank you. Like that, you know, that night, the emotions must have been at an all time high on two completely different spectrums. Right. You have oh, all of the emotions and all of the rage flowing through your body, all of the adrenaline um, to try to, you know, avenge or uh, get revenge for the death of your father. But then on the other side, you're seeing your family and you're seeing your wife and your and your first son. Um, in the rearview mirror on that picture, and you have all of those emotions uh, of love and overwhelming joy for your family. So you have two of these completely opposite emotions butting heads. And for somebody, you know, at a young age at the time, you know, I, I don't, you know, recall exactly how old you were, but, you know, I'm guessing, you know, let's say, you know, mid 20s or early 30s, something around that time. 29. 29. 29. So, you know, young man at the time, to make that decision in the heat of the moment to say no and go the completely different route from everything goes against everything that you were you know taught in that life i have to applaud you for that because that's probably one of the most difficult decisions that you ever had to make up until that point in your life and and thank you because that is uh that's a beautiful that's a beautiful comment and mm. and i i really take that to heart thank you well, you're welcome. And and then to move forward into, like you said, your platform and now to to go ahead and try to change and impact even just one person every single day, right? Because, you know, I'm sure you reflect on saying, listen, I, what's done is done. I can't change anything that happened in the past. But from this moment going forward, I can be different. I can be better. I can help people who need help that might be facing you know, a, a similar battle, a similar butting of heads, butting of emotions, and they need to, need to make a decision, you can be like, listen, I've been there. I've made that decision. Let me help you into making the right one going forward. And that's the beautiful yeah. thing about social media is we talk about where it's a blessing and a curse. And some people can use it, um, yes. you know, to get stuck into it, whether you're scrolling, whether you're, you're hate commenting, or you can go down that dark path and not use it for anything but time wasting, or you can use it like we are collectively where 
we're trying to make an impact. We're trying to spread positivity and spread love and spread the joy to people and help them make better decisions and help them lead a better life. And that's a beautiful thing. Like if it wasn't for social media, we wouldn't be connected with you. We wouldn't be having that's this right. conversation if it wasn't for that's social right. media. So it can be a beautiful yeah. thing if you use it the right way. Amen. Preach to Amen. that, brother. Preach to that. Preach, man. That's my preach for the but episode, you know man. <laughs> but listen, I will I have to give all the props to my children because obviously they're the young ones. They know what social media is all about. And there were times, uh, for example, like during the show, uh, people, not many, but a few people said some pretty foul things. Like, it, my daughter's boyfriend's black. The kid treats her well, you know? I don't give a, it don't matter to me what color the kid's skin is because so let's just say I was racist and I told my daughter, yeah, you have to be with a white guy. But meanwhile, if the white guy beats my daughter, where's the right. justice in that? You know? Right. So they would make comments about stuff like that. Um, my eldest uh, child is, um, he, they're trans um, and they're going through a tough time, you know, trying to navigate their feelings, their life. Um, how people judge them. Um, so they had shown me the way uh, that social media does not necessarily have to be evil. So quote unquote, you know, um, it can be very positive. And they showed me the way by sending me such beautiful, positive things, whether it be about trans people, um, how um, black people today, what they have to deal with that we don't, as white people, don't understand that it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. Um, I can say I understand, but do I really? Mm. You know, I'm not black. So I don't know what it feels like to to be susceptible to the things that, that they go through. So it's things like that that they had shown me. Even my littlest guy, my 13-year-old, Nico, um, will send me the most positive sports stuff, you know? Love uh, seeing that. Players. Love seeing yeah, clips like me that. Too. Me being a sports guy from, you know, growing up, I love seeing the good sportsmanship and I love seeing the good sports clips when you have, you know, somebody with autism being a, the general manager of a team and it's the last oh. se- game of the season and they help them get a, a bucket yes. on the basketball. I just, I love seeing right? that because that's what sports is all about. That will always bring tears to my eyes. A thousand percent always. You know, there's a yeah. um, there's a, a quote, actually. So there was a show that I used to watch when I was a kid called The Munsters. Um, it was on oh, T- yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was on TV land. And Herman Munster, um, Fred Gwynn, I believe he, uh, he passed away, so yeah, God rest Fred his soul. Gwynn. But mm-hmm. he actually said something that stuck with me. And I see it a lot on social media. Yeah, I think no, you know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. And he's he, Frankenstein, right? He's, he was Frankenstein. And yeah. he's talking to mm-hmm. his son on the show. And he says, listen, it doesn't matter... Um, Eddie. Yeah, it doesn't Eddie. matter the color of your skin. Doesn't matter if you're you're short or tall, if you're fat or skinny, if you're black or white. He goes, or if you're handsome like your father. Uh, he says, <laughs> what matters is um, uh, the. He goes, what matters is the size of your heart and the content of your character. Yep. And we say that all the time. It's like, listen, I don't, you know, Amen. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you believe in. You show me how you treat other people. And that's how I'm going to treat you, right? Like if you treat other people with respect, you treat them with kindness, that's all I need to know. doesn't matter where you come that's from. It. doesn't matter the color your skin, what you believe in, that's you know, it. what your your sexual orientation is. That None of that matters, okay? We all bleed red and it all matters is what – how do you treat other people? The content of your character. Yeah. Again, amen. Amen. Love it. This is why, this is why I love your guys' show. Honest to God, I'm not just. You know, there's enough. Blow, there's enough negative you know. shit out there, right? You look at the news; everything's negative, right? What, tell me one positive thing the news is talking about. Right? And the only time they show a positive thing, yeah. it lasts for maybe five seconds. Yeah, you know. Go, yeah, Why do you write a yeah. whole story about that? That's a great thing. You know, they'll say, "Okay, firefighter saved you know a family from a, a burning building." All right, now on to the next car crash. I go, wait, uh, yeah. I want to hear this story. Okay. <laughs> there's so there's it's like yeah, I was I was listening. Uh, you know, I, I really don't watch the news too much. I have every morning with my mother-in-law, 
Um, she makes makes espresso for me every day, so we have coffee every day. Nice. And so we we'll, we'll put the news on for a little while. And as I was just coming inside to uh, deal with my back and try to figure out how I'm going to sit, right now I got the heating pad behind me. Um, oh, so it's feeling pretty and, good now. It's feeling <laughs> nice yeah, and loose. It right now. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. Um, but they talked about our space military. And I'm like, space military. I'm like, look, I get that you guys we want global dominance down here as the United States. I guess I, I get it. But to go into space and now try to have ruling over space, I, I don't get it. And they got 14,000 people guys. working for it, too. I think I saw the yeah, same 14, thing. 14,000. So you heard it, too. Yeah. And and the first thing I thought of, I don't know about you guys, but one of my pet peeves, something I really enjoy, is um, anything about unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs, if you will. Yeah. And I'm a believer. I'm not ashamed to say it. Uh, I think we'd be foolish to think that we're the only living species in our universe. I'm with you. We're in galaxy. agreement there. <laughs> We're in agreement there. Right? So I couldn't help but think this morning, if they are watching us like they say they are, what the fuck could they possibly be thinking <laughs> when we talk about having a space military? They must be like, hey, 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 hey. You guys are late to the party, you know? We've been ruling this this blackness for a long time now. So uh, you guys might want to rethink putting nukes up there, you know, because I'm, I'm going to disarm them every time. Um, so, but listening to that, having a space military, it kind of like sends a chill up your back, you know. Um, I understand we need a military. I understand that we need control over our skies. Um, I do understand that we do need, I guess, protection, if you will. Um, but to start arming space, I don't know how I feel about it. So they spoke about something beautiful just prior to that. Um, uh, I think it was a kid that was missing, was found. Um, they spoke maybe 30 seconds about that. But then they talked about having the space program, the space military, for about a good 15 minutes. And I'm like... <laughs> like, what a waste of 15 minutes, man. <laughs> yeah, that I'll never get back again. Right? You know? No, but I, so, I, I actually, you know, I'm a, a num I'm a numbers guy, right? I have a, a numbers brain, mathematical brain. So when I look at the amount of... First of all, you know, the amount of stars that, that are in our universe right the amount of planet uh, galaxies and then the amount of planets here that, we go buckle right? in baby like We're going no, in. it's short but I, i'm a numbers guy okay, right I love it. i'm a numbers guy so when if you just look at the amount of planets that are out there right yeah. there's millions okay millions of planets that are out there yeah. you're gonna tell me <laughs> that there's only one that has any sort of life on it for sure Right. And I think it's like millions on millions. Right. Do you realize that the statistical probability of that happening is like next to nilch? It's nothing. Yeah. Like you have a better That's shot of winning the lottery like 15 times in a row. OK. <laughs> it's like I don't know if you guys if you guys ever heard this, but there is a saying I, and I'm I'm gathering it's true that they're saying that there are more stars and planets than every grain of sand yeah. that yep is all over the world I've heard and you're gonna tell me that there's that. one that has like come on one living yeah. come on yeah there's st yeah. something so there's gotta be something we, out there we do have that technology to get et home i did, did hear that too so and then the other thing too is like you know i yeah. i heard this one this one uh somebody said this this one time where they they compared it to all right when we're looking for we have a little 
I think it's just the mixer. Or is it us? Oh, no, it's good. Um, so when you have, let's say you got this, these aliens, come in, right, that you're looking for. And we think that they are, we're looking for people that are more advanced than we are, right? Much more advanced than we are. So let's take a look at what's, what are we way more advanced to compare, right? Think of ants, okay? If you walk by and there's an ant colony, are you going to mm-hmm. stop and like stare at them and examine them and try to learn something from them? No, you just walk on because no. you, you had nothing to learn from them. You're yeah. way more advanced than them. Right. So if we're looking for another species that's way more advanced than us, why would they even stop and and look at us? What do they have to learn from us? If they're so much more that's... advanced, <laughs> why do they give a shit what we're doing? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I, I am a believer in that I do feel, obviously I feel they do exist, um, but I do think that they are peaceful because I do think that they are so much more advanced than us that if they really, really, really wanted to hurt us, they would have done it. We wouldn't be here as a planet. Yeah, they would have done it. Yep. Yeah. So I think that they interfere and it's been, it's been noted that they interfere in times of war, mostly, you know, um, I guess obviously they know maybe a little bit more ahead of us what's coming. And that's the only time they say that they will ever interfere in our world is if they feel that we're going to destroy humanity and obviously the planet in the process. And and there's a lot to be said in that. Yeah. You know, um, I know it, it does sound like an off the wall topic. Not at my, all. My terminology. It's, no, not at all. It sounds um, like a, it sounds like a real life Men in Black, right? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. And I, I think our government knows a lot more than they they tell us. Hundred yeah. percent. Like we're too weak. Yeah, like we're we're too weak to accept it. And I'm sorry, I don't come from that background of feeling weak. So, no. I still, I live out in Arizona. I wish I was out here in 97 for the Phoenix Lights. I didn't get out here until, uh, I want to say, 03 or 04. So, but from what I understand, and I spoke to uh, one gentleman that was actually present for it, actually saw it. Um, And you're going to laugh. Well, you might not laugh, but um, this gentleman uh, just finished uh, a major project on uh, unidentified aerial phenomenons, and um, he wants to write a book with me. Really? And he, yeah, he wants to write a father-son story. Um, he feels that it's a story that needs to be told. And I have kicked around doing a book probably for the last 10 years, easy, um, with personal friends. Um, with a few other people and I never felt that it was coming off organically. I felt like the narrative was getting twisted. And the one thing I always said that if I do do a book is that I want the reader to hear my voice. Now, if I could run that in conjunction with, again, my platform. Um, I think there's a lot to be said in that. I I don't know if I really would care at the end of the day how many books sold. I mean, obviously, we want to sell books, of course. Um, But if it's not going to be for the right reasons, then I don't want part of the project. And um, this gentleman made me understand that it would come off in a positive way. Did you ever think so, about doing, you know, if you were to do the book, um, something you can do is you could be the reader for the audio version of it and you could oh, put out yeah, an yeah. audio book and it would be your voice reading the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I I'm, think of that. I'm surprised you actually don't have a book already because I feel like your story mm-hmm. is great for a book. I mean, 
I've read a, a you know a handful of books, a bunch of books, but um, more than a handful. Yeah, more than that. so I was like <laughs> quite a bit more than a handful. That's all right. I got them all. I got them all behind me. They're all up there. Some are mostly, but most of them are signed too. So but that's so I'm. Uh, so that's what I was saying. So I'm. I'm actually surprised that you don't have a book out already. You know, kind of telling your story and. It's very interesting. It's very interesting that and your 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 love for your father because you know any any son any guy you know majority wants to look up to their father. Yeah, you want to make Papa proud. Yeah, you want to make your dad proud. Yeah. And uh, so I'm sure if, whenever you make that book, it'll it'll be a top seller for sure. Oh, I'm definitely gonna buy you know, it. I'm definitely reading it. If, whenever it comes out, you gotta let us know. I'm buying the first copy. Of course. <laughs> you give us of your book, course. we'll give you our cigar. There even, you go. Even ah. trade. Oh, yeah, guys, I'm looking forward to this. You know that. I yeah. told you. Um, the only caveat to me doing the book is that there are so many families that were affected by my dad, uh, a lot in a positive way, but there are those that were afflicted in a negative way. And I never want any of those people, family members, children, to be like, I can't believe this guy wrote a book. You know, they killed your father or they killed your husband or they killed your uncle or your grandpa, whatever. And I, I, I felt that apologize is probably not even the, the best word, but remorse i think is the most important if i can get that point across um to those people i think doing the book would be a lot easier Mm -hmm. if that makes sense to you because the story is there you know the facts are there you know it's just a matter of putting them down on paper Mm -hmm. um so we'll see we'll see we'll see where it goes and I'm sure you guys will probably be one of the first people to know, without a doubt. Would love it. Would love to read it. Would love to read it. So, so but, you, um, you were kind of cutting. You were kind of cutting in, in and out. But in a nutshell, you were saying you're kind of hesitant of creating a book about your life and your relationship with your father because you don't want to impact those people that were affected by yourself or your father um, in the past. Mm-hmm. Yes, like let's say let's say that they were finally able to let go of something. Okay, uh, a, hur- a, hur- a horrific uh, incident that may have happened to, let's say, their family. And let's say they finally got over it, whether it be 20 years ago, five mm-hmm. years ago, whatever you, what have you. Um, and then all of a sudden, a book comes out. And you pick it up and you scroll to the back. And right away, you're looking for names. And then all of a sudden, you see either your dad's name or your husband's name or your whatever. I just want to make sure that it comes off as classy and as apologetic, remorseful, um, and there will be a stern warning that obviously reading some of the stuff that you might read in the book um, might not be easy to digest. So think twice before picking it up and reading it. You could even put in in the beginning of the book a uh, I know a lot of authors will put like a preface um, before the oh, yes. first chapter yes. and you can explain all of these things of you know how you're feeling now and how you'd like this book to come across and how you're remorseful and all these things prior to reading the book to kind of set people up and then obviously throughout the book you can just change names so that it's nobody's real name in the in in the book you can come up with a different name um, to save, to let other people save face so that they don't, it doesn't come out, you know, publicly. Um, yeah. And just be graceful about it. Yeah. You know? So what, what, so, um, what, in, what brought you on to the show on MTV? What, um, you know, how did that whole thing unravel? Like, what, what, how did they approach you? What was you and your, you and your family's thinking process of getting on that show? Um, if I can give it to you in somewhat of a nutshell. Um, I was having uh, breakfast uh, with an old, old friend at the time, an old friend that I haven't seen in many, many years. Um, you could let your imagination run wild. <laughs> um, 
And we were talking about okay. uh, making money and earning and stuff like that. And I had let on that, uh, you know, money's been, you know, it's there, but it's getting by. And, and I had told this person that, you know, if anything comes down the pipe, you know, let me know. I says, I'll be willing to sit at any table with you and, and, you know, work on a project together. Um, no sooner as we wrapped up and I think I left the meeting, um, a couple of days later, I got a call, um, and I went and met this person again, uh, again for breakfast and, uh, they had just pitched the show to me and right away in my head, I was like, uh, no, no, I, I, no, because right away I thought of mob wives and <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I am not one to tune in and watch, you know, females battling it out week in and week out. So um, that was a little bit of a drawback. Um, and I actually contemplated not even telling my family because I, I, I felt like I might have been overstepping, if you will. And then I had thought to myself, well... You know, you're all about honesty and you're all about your relationship with your children and your, and your wife. And so would it be fair to them if you don't tell them? And I fought with it probably for about a good two days, not, not too much longer than that, two, about two days. And uh, I pitched it to my eldest child. And right away, my eldest child was like, yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. Let's do it. And uh, then we brought it to my daughter. Um, she had agreed. My little guy, um, he didn't give a shit one way or the other. <laughs> like, hey, that's what you to do. Well, you know, I'm up on you know. Um, and, you know, my youngest, um, he's right or die. You know, he'll do anything with me and for me, you know, as all my children will. But my little guy was the funniest. And but my wife, no. And just like that. Nah. Not doing it. Did that that yep. It Stern. did not get past anything past no. And <laughs> I had brought the kids in the bedroom and I was like, listen, your mom, uh, she flat out said no. And all of a sudden they they got up and they came in the bedroom. And they kind of like leaned into my wife respectfully, but they leaned into her. Like, how can you do this to us? It's something we can do. We can make money. She's um, like, I'm your mother. I, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> I brought you in this world. I'll take you out. <laughs> Mama yeah. said no. So that, yeah. So that was her feeling. And um, I really was not going to push it. But I saw how much the kids were into it. And I was like, look, babe, let's just do it. Like, it's been so long. You know, we can talk about some things that we've been wanting to get off our chest for many years, but weren't able to. Um, we can give people a little glimpse of what our life was like, you know, since we left New York. And I'm like, look, I'm like, it doesn't have to be like what you might be thinking. I said to her. And, you know, the kids just kept pressing her. And probably like after like the third day, um, the contracts came in um, and there was an amount of money on it. And my eldest child's like, ah, you know, I, I, I think we need more. Nice. And I'm like, all right, you got it. I'm like, you got it. You got it. I'm like, take the reins, man. You know, you're 23 years old. Go ahead. You're good. I got your back. And, uh, they took it over. They handled it. They got what they wanted. Um, yeah, add another zero at and, the end of that, and we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I signed the contract. Uh, the kids signed it, and everybody's waving the contract in front of Nala's face. My wife's name's Nala, and um, I remember her taking the pen and kind of like just like looking like, oh, I'm doing this, but. Just so you know, I just I'm not into doing this. Uh, and uh, 
she signed it and um you know the rest is history uh it was definitely an experience um to say the least um we learned a lot about each other as a family that i don't think we would have necessarily known um maybe later in time but uh, for instance, my, my, my firstborn being non-binary uh, and trans femme. So um, we learned about that, a lot of that in the process. Um, I learned a lot about my daughter, um, about what a daddy's girl she is. You know? <laughs> I never realized um, you know, how much the kid really adored me. Um, but then the fear factor set in, not, not for me, but I think more on their minds, uh, would just run wild, I guess, at times, Hey dad, like, what if we do this and someone finds out where you live and, you know, they want to settle an old score and so on and so on. And I'm like, look. We're fine. Ain't no one coming to hurt me. And if they do, I'll see it coming a mile away. I'm like, we're in the middle of Arizona. I will spot any of these <laughs> coming from a mile away. I feel like they're going to so, stick out like a sore thumb over there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of put those fears at bay for a little bit. Um, but again, it was it was fun to do. It was a job. Like anything else, you know, you got to be on set at a certain time. You got to be camera ready uh, or you got to be at this location at this time. And um, but for the most part, it was a, it was a positive thing, you know. Um, so it brought your family together more like closer. Just going to say that. Being yeah, on the sh- it, it definitely did. It definitely did. I wish there was more things that came out on the show that, that kind of wound up probably on the floor basically you know when i cut stuff um but for the most part it gave people somewhat of a glimpse of wow you know we were thinking a but wow it turned out to be totally b sure so um yeah it was a positive thing um but all the notoriety not all of it um it came at a cost you know um like for instance i'm sure that there are people in the government that aren't happy with it um probably not happy that we came out and spoke um but like i said again for the most part it was positive yeah you can't can't please everybody right that's a that's a rule that yeah. I I've started to I've I learned sure. it's like you listen you can't please everybody right no matter what you do somebody's gonna be upset and they're just gonna have to get over it yeah yeah I mean you, you see a lot of these guys um, that were in the life back in the day that you know doing their own thing they got YouTube shows you know they got podcasts and stuff like that so yeah. you know it's not like you're the only one you know there's guys out there yeah. talking you know. And I have like Michael Francesi, he's he's huge. Like he's got a huge platform. Oh, he's, or he's huge, all huge. over. Uh, have you ever came across it? I think I believe I saw a picture with you. A picture. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Michael is someone. Being that you mentioned Michael, um, Michael is someone that I I admire very much so because Michael walked away from the light and never looked back, and Michael became. Um, a wonderful father, as if he, I'm sure he was prior. But when you listen to Michael speak, or if you talk to him, um, he became uh, a well-rounded, beautiful human being. Um, granted, uh, there are some people out there that can ruffle his feathers, um, which is understandable. But he will always uh, resort back to uh, positive talk, positive thinking, uh, believes in his church. Um, and I have nothing but mad respect for somebody like that. And I can actually say this to you guys, um, honestly, that watching Michael 
for the first time years ago. Um, it was inspiring to me. And, and I thought to myself, well, if Michael can do it, then so can I. Mm. Now, I don't, I don't mean about you know, how huge his platform is and his followers and stuff like that. Um, but I just mean it as a human being, yeah. you know, um, that I can be a better father. I can be a better husband. Um, both my parents are past so uh, a better son-in-law, if you will, take care of my wife's family. Um, so Michael is someone that, for me, is very inspiring. Listening to Michael speak, I can listen to him all the time. And, and if you've watched him, uh, now that he has his own podcast, um, he brings on some pretty cool people. Like I just watched, uh, he did an interview with Chaz Voluntary. Sure. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And, um, you know, Chaz asked some pretty deep questions. And Michael answered them, you know, and I was very proud. I really was. I was very proud inspired and i have huge admiration uh for michael i truly do did you did he's a love there for was, was he before your time did you guys ever cross paths when you were younger no uh michael is older than me um his dad uh sonny um was very close to my dad Got it. um but they never really hung out um, I don't remember, recall Michael ever being around our club. Um, Sonny, yeah, but not Michael. So you weren't, you weren't um, fighting Michael twice a week like you were, uh, well, you were no, a buddy? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Yeah, that's, an, that's another story in itself. I, I remember, you know, <laughs> reading up on you and, and, and I read that your father had a relationship with, you know, the guys out in Jersey and who was based off of the Sopranos. And I was like, wow, that's a fun little fun fact yeah. because you can't see it. I mean, we got pictures of Sopranos and stuff like oh, that. Yeah, you can't see it. Right behind it, Eric, we know, got a picture. Right? I'm okay. quoting the Sopranos every other day. My friends yeah. are sending me videos of the Sopranos the other day. It's like one of my favorite shows, obviously. Yeah, just like, just like you yeah, said, well, like you said, your father had the, um, you know, going to his man cave and you had all these posters up, right? And you start, if you look at our, this is our studio that we kind of turned into, you know, a man cave it's our smoking lounge but we got all the po- right we got the posts over there we got yeah. al pacino over there we got the sopranos right we got all the posters up on the walls <laughs> when you when walk I in come here. back east guys i have to come down and see you guys like i want to come to the studio absolutely yeah, absolutely without a doubt out, without a know? doubt that'd be great that'd be great um, now one thing about you know mentioning the sopranos um i remember my dad seeing it for the first time and he, he thought it was quite comical uh, in, from the aspect that he's like, someone is giving them this information. <laughs> They're getting it from somewhere. Yep. Because, you know, he felt it was spot on. But not only that, when the whole part with the war that was going on with Johnny Sack, that was all based on the Colombo War. When, when the agent slaps the desk, you know, um, we just won this thing. I think he said something to that effect. That was really said by an agent, uh, a, def- a bad agent, by the way, by the name of Linda Vecchio, um, who was the one that recruited Greg Scarpa back in the day, who flipped him. Yeah. That knew Greg was out there committing murders and was turning, you know, a blind eye to it. So... But when he smacks the desk and he says, oh, we just won this thing, and they all looked at him in the office like, what do you mean we just, who's we, you know? Um, That was all based on the Colombo family, Wow. you know? Even in The Godfather, um, I just saw a commercial for something called... Uh, yeah, they're making a movie about making the Godfather. About yeah. making, yeah, about making, yeah. Yeah, because Joe, Joe, there was a Joe Colombo who kind of advised uh, yeah. Francis Coppola. Yeah, and he kind of said Francis like, for a couple of years. he's yeah. like, hey, you know, take that out. You know, don't say this. You know. Some, yeah, somebody Jimmy was Khan, was talking. Somebody was giving him info. Yeah, and Jimmy Khan, um, he was at my sister's wedding. Wow, you know, um, so he was. Close to some Colombo guys. Jimmy Conway, you months. said? Jimmy Con- is Jimmy Conway, is that what you said? Or Jimmy, uh, no, Jimmy no, Con? No, no, Jimmy Con. James Con. James Con. James okay. Con, who played Sonny. Got it, got it, got um, it. 
he was around knock around guys, you know? So, you know, if you think about it, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I guess, in a way, I hope I'm not disappointed because I'm really curious to see how they spin the whole sure. Joe Colombo aspect of it, you know, mm-hmm. um, how James Khan. I mean, I, I do know, but I, I would like to know what they portray mm-hmm. on how James Khan became involved. Um, so it, it it should be fun, I guess. We'll see. That's you know that whole that whole background of making the Godfather such an interesting uh, interesting story because there's also the other guy on YouTube, I forget his name. We were just talking about him before. Yeah, um, he wasn't he wasn't a mafia guy, but he was involved. Um, he was in the Godfather. Who played? I'm gonna, the, I'll find his name. I'll find his name. He was the he was the son-in-law. He was married to the Godfather's daughter. Um, oh, you mean the one who beat up Talia Shia? He gets killed, and what's his face beats him in the street. I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sonny beat him up in the street. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Finish. Finish. I forgot his his name doesn't come to me, but he made a book I think called The Hollywood Godfather, and uh, he was going like head to head with uh, with Brando, Gianni Russo. Gianni Russo, that's his name. Gianni Russo. Yes, and like t- him telling the story of him and him like in an, like practicing the acting class with with Marlo Brando, and they're like, you know, don't look at his face, you know, don't give him a hard time. And the Marlo, Marlo Brando was like, you know, who is this guy? Like, you know, get him out of here. And he kind of goes to him. He's like, yo, you know. Don't take any way oppor- don't take any opportunities away from me. You know, like this. this I'm the real deal. Yeah, I was gonna. Can you imagine? Can you imagine for one second an actor turning around telling somebody a street guy, yeah, who just happens to be on set to give guidance, maybe, as administrative will say, and you turn around, and you tell the guy, hey, whatever you do, don't look at Marlon Brando in the eyes. The answer <laughs> I would have gave was. I'll take his eyes out of his fucking head. Yeah, I don't have to worry about him. I was like, who the what fuck do you, you think you're talking to? Oh, yeah, like, get the fuck out of here, man. Like, that's... It's bizarre. I mean, that that, that guy's got some more. That. That, that guy's got some crazy stories. His his whole life was wild. But I thought that was so but interesting. You, you know, like... Uh, you got to tip your hat. He did play the, uh, he played the role. Of course. I mean, Sa- like, it saved his. Guys, it man. saved his life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It saved his life. Sure you, you, if you watch that documentary, sure it saved that man's yeah. life. So. Yes, with Pablo Escobar, that's even wilder. But like Joe Colombo brought Gianni Russo on, and uh, Francis Coppola was like, "Yeah, yeah, he'll get a part. He'll get a part." And he's like, "No, no, no. Like he's gonna get a, like a, a starting role. He's not just gonna be a guy in the background. Like this is my guy. Right. He he's gonna be in there." And I just thought it was so interesting how that whole concept played out. Right? Oh my god. So that's that. But uh, you know, the last thing we'll ask you know, like, what's what's the next big thing for Bill Cotolo Jr.? Like, any, any good plans? Any cigar oh. shops opening? A cigar? Any what's what's going on for you? You know, that's something that um, I just met with for the first time again. Never done this before. I met with a couple of guys that I met on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram, I believe, from September of 2020. Okay, and. Uh, they've been following me for a while. I always tap them back. So they happen to live out here and they just messaged me one day. Hey, Bill, would you like to get together and go have a cigar, maybe at a cigar place or whatever? And they sent me like a list of joints and they're like, you pick the place. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm going to pick the place because, you know, I, I don't know you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, listen, in all fairness to everybody out there that's going to listen to this, um, it's nothing personal. It's just um, you never know who might want to do you harm, if I could say it like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so you always have to have that in the back of your mind. Um, the other thing is that I, I will not ever be used. Um, so these gentlemen are not like that at all. Just two sweet guys. So we got together and mind you, my back was, they're like, Bill, we understand if you want to cancel. I'm like, nope. I'm like, listen, I'm a man of my word. I said, I told you guys a month ago that this is going to happen. I said, I'll make my way to the place. I promise. You. Uh, and that's why I, I thank you so much for, 
us doing this today versus yesterday when everybody we were all geared up to do it. Absolutely. Um, but anyhow, uh, so we went, we met, and we just were chit chatting, and, and uh, two lovable guys that did not pester me about, hey, tell us about this or you know, yeah. We're Fan, doing, we, uh, we call those people fanboys. It's a little bit different. Fa- you call them fanboys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were not like that. You know, we just, the conversation was easy. You know, yes, I did t- talk about my past to an extent, talked about my dad to an extent, shared a couple of stories with them. Um, you know, I hope that I didn't, uh, sca- I don't want to use the word scared, but bother them uh, in a couple of things that we spoke about. But anyway, make a long story short, um, I had just said to them, I'm like, would you guys be interested maybe in, in opening up a cigar lounge? And uh, one of the guys that's there, he used to be a youth distributor out here in Arizona. Uh, he also had his own place in Florida. But uh, something happened where uh, he had a, a huge difference with apartment. Um, so they were a little leery about jumping back in. And I'm like, I'd look, I understand if you're a little leery about jumping into a business with me. I'm like, but just so you know, I'm not the type of person that you're thinking of from over 20 years ago. You know, if I embark on something like this, um, I will be just as much as a part of that business as, you know, as all of us, you know, putting our time in, our efforts. Um, and uh, they actually, after we, we broke up that night. Uh, the following day, I got a, a message on Instagram saying, uh, it was a voice message uh, saying, hey, Bill, I hope everything's well. I hope your back's okay. Um, but I did speak to uh, a couple of friends of mine that were already interested in opening up uh, a cigar lounge. And they're very interested about, you know, doing it with you. So, um I was hoping that tomorrow, if I'm able to walk, you know, um, I would like to get together with them. They want to do coffee tomorrow. Um, Stop breaking it down to see, like, you know, who needs to be what to the table, what's our, uh, you know, our vision, so on and so forth. Um, So that's something that for me is very promising. It's something that I, I want to do for years now. Um, then the next thing is a movie. Wow. A movie. Okay. Yeah. So cliff notes, cliff um, notes. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, everybody, you know, writes a book first and then they do a movie. So, you know, I had said to this person, I'm like, what if we switch it up? Like, what if we don't do a book and we just go right to film? I was like, would that be the worst thing in the world? And they're like, well, typically it doesn't work that way, but I can't see it being hurtful, you know? So I says, look, as long as I have input and i'm going to use air quotes as long as i have input in who we bring in um i will have to be on the set every day you know um because nobody knows how my dad spoke and how he carried himself more so than than me you know whether it be in the father hat or with the skipper hat so that's very important to me um the last thing that I would ever want to do is um, embarrass my dad's, if you want to call it a legacy. Um, that's one thing I will not do. And I will not deter from that. So if it can materialize and we do have people with money and, I, and guys, I'm talking about money, like money, money. It, like ridiculous money. big boy money <laughs> big boy money like we're not so talking about like rich we're talking about wealth <laughs> yeah, like when I'm talking about jumping on Delta they're like well no we, we can pick you up like, pick me up say what now what? <laughs> I'm like I just drove 
I just drove from fucking Arizona to Vegas and you guys could have picked me up. I'm like, you guys could have led with that. <laughs> um, so we'll see. Like, so those are, they're definitely attainable goals. I just have to make sure that I can keep myself motivated to want to do it. Like I just, because I have my days guys, like I, I'm not the happiest guy every day, you know? Um, I told you guys about my injuries and that plays a huge role in my daily life. Like every, every minute of every day, it's, it's pain, you know? So it, I have to keep myself motivated. Um, and as long as I can see that each day that we're becoming closer and closer and being more and more positive about what we're doing, um, I think that, and again, of course, with the, with the blessings of my family, um, I think that they're definitely attainable goals. You know, um, I will never sell my family short. Everything that they say to me um, has weight when it comes to making choices and, you know, decisions. So, um, but they're definitely attainable goals, guys. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. Are, those are some definitely. I might have a so. I don't know. After today, I might have a cigar podcast. There hey. you go, man. I want, we want to be the first guest. Cigars with Bill, baby. Let's go. <laughs> I like it. Those yeah. are, those I'll are... just keep promoting with you guys. And, and, you know, just keep giving my blessings and, and tuning into you guys. We well, appreciate you know, you that. You guys are here for me, man. We appreciate well, we that. Appreciate it. We definitely want to have you back on, man. I feel like we, you know, we've been going. This is by far the longest um conversation that we've had on the yeah, podcast uh sure. we've gone for over two hours but i feel like we can go for another two so we're gonna have to uh bring you back on and have a second especially if you get a, a cigar lounge then we got to do the of podcast course. in the lounge with our cigar with about- our cigar <laughs> oh man hey you know what that's a great idea too you know what to put like a studio yeah, absolutely. Cigar, you just got to put. Hey, you, you, know, you call it the back room. Let me tell yeah. you, we'll go into the back room. I'll be right. Like, hey, you want? Let's the got, VIP. Well, listen, if, if if we name it, and I have it my way, we'll call it something like the Social Club. You know, easy as that. I love it. I love it. Come down, have a cigar, enjoy a cigar with Bill. You know, that's come down to the social life. club. That's, that's that's what it's all about. I love it. And you have a little studio in the you back, know? a little private room that. uh you know, you have your, your your little podcasting, your little lounge. You want to have some business meetings, some business dinners. I yeah, love it. I love know. it. It's endless. Who knows where we could take it? All right. We'll see. Well, Bill, we uh we really appreciate you coming out and hanging yes, out with us for two you. hours, man. We appreciate you uh-huh. allowing us to be your first podcast and kind of telling us your story and your experiences and all the things you love about cigars. So we couldn't be any more happier to have you as a guest. <laughs> and um, you. you know, you can find Bill Cotolo on you know on Instagram. I believe your name is Bill just Bill Cotolo on Instagram. Yep, at Bill Cotolo. Yep. So and uh yep. You know, if you do message him, he's pretty responsive if you're a good person. If you're not a good person, you can kick rocks. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, but other than that, Bill, we're going to send you off again. Uh, <laughs> nice to say, please say, um, you know, to anybody that's watching, uh, um, a lot of people send me direct messages. Um, I will always get back to you. Um, it might not be that day. It might not be the next day but i will always always take the time to get back to people you know i mean that's the least that i can do you know um a man of his word but it keeps it positive that's yeah. right like i love I said, it if, if you're not being positive you know you can kick rocks so bill you're that's uh it, man just keep it moving you're yep. a man of your word again we appreciate you coming on it's been great hanging out with you and we're looking forward to the future and hanging out with you in person hopefully soon yeah, all right. There you all go. right. So as we say on the podcast, chin chin, salute, cheers. Chin done. Chin done.